Yo, it's me. And I read all of the wonderful things you say about me, both, you know, kind and down bad. Uh, and it, it honestly, it makes me feel like a celebrity. And I'm so healthy and normal now. Remember that big thing that went down in 2020? It sure is great that nothing bad will ever happen again. I hope you're sitting somewhere comfortable right now. No slouching. This is a story about failure. I was born on Sunday, September 22nd, 1996, with a life-threatening congenital heart defect called transposition of the great arteries. I came into this world discolored, silent, and in need of immediate open-heart surgery. Basically, my arteries were crisscrossed in a way where the oxygen-rich red blood was being sent back to my lungs, and the oxygen-poor blue blood was being sent around my body. Before I was born, my father chose my name by practicing the way an NFL stadium announcer would shout it as I ran onto the field. Man plans, God laughs. Connor Cunningham would never play contact sports. Connor Cunningham would never be a quarterback. Before I could even think, I had a message tattooed to my chest. Memento Mori. On Thursday, March 12th, 2020, I was 23 years old and I had my annual cardiologist appointment in New Hyde Park, New York. Most of the specialists for my specific issue are pediatric cardiologists, meaning that when I see them, I have to do so at colorful facilities meant for children. It's my best option, so I don't really mind it. When I laid down on the cold paper cover to get my echocardiogram, I asked the technician to change the TV channel from Nick Jr. to Sports Center. The NBA and NHL had suspended their season. I thought, okay, basketball, hockey, those are indoor sports. Certainly the Mets season would start on time. They're gonna go all the way this year. 2020 was the first time I ever considered the possibility of living in another country. But that will come a little bit later. Back then, I had a more urgent goal to divert my efforts towards. I want to find some way to help. I'm sick of staring into this little flashlight I keep in my pocket all the time. I need to do something, or I'm just gonna feel worse. While sifting through Pokemon cards in my parents' attic, I thought back to December 19th, 2008, when the Speed Gamers hosted a 72-hour charity marathon in a time before Twitch even existed. I was 12 years old, and I remember sneaking away from my grandparents' Christmas party to watch it on the dusty old computer in their basement. I wished I could be playing like that too, using my encyclopedic knowledge of the early Pokemon games to catch them all for a good cause. As if a brightly colored plastic key from my childhood could open a safe filled with gold, silver, crystals. The entire world was in chaos. Who knew how long this thing was going to last? I would regret it forever if I didn't at least try. Out of an honest love for making people's lives better, I started my Twitch channel, Rabbit House Games. Cunningham is an Irish last name that means rabbit house. At my family's home, we get a lot of wild ones just hanging out, eating our leftover vegetables. Rabbits are weak little creatures that survive through sheer numbers. The name reminds me that I can't do this alone. I decided October 31st would be the day of the Rabbit House Games Halloween Spooktacular. I obviously couldn't go to a party with my friends, so unless I filled that day with something, it would have just been miserable. I really wanted to learn what my potential could be as who I am right now. I filmed a little promo on my phone's camera and declared I'd match up to $500 of all donations. I did not anticipate reaching that mark. I got some help promoting the event from my friends at Wonderville, an indie arcade bar in Brooklyn. I could tell they were always looking for small streamers to reach out to them so they could use their presence to help promote charity events like this. Throughout the day, I did silly things I thought people would find funny. Among Us was the big game at the time, so I hit up some Twitter mutuals to play and help promote the event. I also invited a representative from the charity on the stream to talk about youth homelessness and incarceration, and the ways the organization supports at-risk young people. Thanks to my real-life friends, family, and even co-workers, we raised over $2,000 that day. It could have failed, but it didn't. I organized this, and nobody would ever be able to take it away. I wanted to do it again. As Christmas was approaching, I thought about putting on the Rabbit House Games Winter Wonderland and structuring it exactly the same. But it didn't feel right to let the people in my life pick up the slack for me again like that. 
In retrospect, this is in direct conflict to what I just said about rabbits needing numbers to survive. But almost immediately, the libidinal surge of internet success caused all these ungrounded thoughts to drift into my mind. I felt like I needed some reason for my Twitch channel to exist other than asking people for donations. If I were to ever truly raise some big money, I'd have to properly establish myself first. Maybe if I found a popular game and just stuck to it, I could grow really fast. I'm not interested in the usual suspects, so I took a look through Twitch Tracker to see if the next big thing was out there, waiting for the right person to find it. Eventually, I encountered something I had truly never seen before. I thought, yeah, this looks like something I could get into. And maybe someday it would be way bigger than it is now. And I could ride that rocket all the way to the top. This is Eternal Return. The root comes oh, through. Jesus, this oh, is oh my god. No reactivation yet. Because he knows he could just parry through it. Yep, oh, there it is. Parry oh! oh! Jeez! Oh. Oh! Oh! Look at the damage! Oh my god! Oh my god! The Grimoire proc! He falling super low. The diamond shard is getting a lot of this damage here. And oh! Actually! Oh! oh, oh, oh what? Just... <laughs> oh! Connects the stun! Into the ult! Oh my god! Wikipedia defines eternal return as a philosophical concept which states that time repeats itself in an infinite loop and that exactly the same events will continue to occur in exactly the same way over and over again for eternity. This also describes the experience of being a fan of the game Eternal Return, developed by South Korean studio Nimble Neuron. And believe me, we'll get to them. But before we do, let's start with the game itself. Eternal Return is a free-to-play battle royale game that features 18 players getting dropped into a large map called Lumia Island fighting to be the last one standing. You can play solo, in pairs of two, or squads of three. The controls and combat play similarly to other MOBA esports games like League of Legends and Dota 2, but instead of farming gold off minions, your core item build is crafted by looting supplies you find around the map. Every game starts with a rat race between Lumia Island's different zones to complete your build as fast as possible. For example, you'll grab some paper in the school, burn it with the lighter you found in the alley, and mix the ash with some water to make poison and upgrade your crossbow with it. As the game goes on, the island gets smaller and smaller, while dangerous roaming mobs appear that can offer buffs and rare loot. It's way more popular in Korea than it is here. You can't even play ranked whenever you want on the North American server since there aren't enough players to get it popping outside of peak hours. Eternal Return is at its best when you're in an equal, uninterrupted fight and you have to win based on your knowledge of the game's mechanics and your ability to read your opponent's actions. It's also really fun to catch someone that fell behind early and snowball that into an insurmountable lead, unless everyone gangs up on you at the end. Nimble Neuron changed a lot over the years, but I'm mostly going to be talking about the version of the game that I fell in love with. Solos was by far the most popular mode for streaming and competitive play back then, and the challenge of personally improving was what initially hooked me. I didn't understand anything at first, and the massive barrier to entry is one of the reasons why it remains so obscure. With so many different games out there, it's rare to find someone willing to put in all the time to learn Eternal Return's convoluted systems, a problem which has become further bloated by the introduction of more and more new game mechanics. Since you can't always play ranked, experienced players are forced to queue into normal lobbies with beginners. As soon as you realize, hey, I recognize that name from YouTube, they've probably already killed you. Before you know anything about this game, you know the road to getting good is paved in your own blood. Just how I like it. 
Back then, I was working a social media job at a marketing startup. I didn't love it, but I was happy with the life it let me live. That is, until we started to feel the financial burdens of a global shutdown. I knew exactly when our top client's contract ended and that I would most likely be laid off when that day came. I was looking forward to just coming home for Christmas that year, changing up my scenery, seeing my family, and getting my mind off my boss typing at me in actual capital letters and exclamation points. Right before the holiday, my dad tested positive for The Thing from 2020. I know he's smart and careful and that it's not his fault, but I'd have to spend my first holiday without my family. Alone in a cold, noisy New York apartment, I ordered Chinese food and dove headfirst into the sunny beaches of Lumia Island. I kept trying because I understood that this was solvable. If I applied myself, I would improve. There was barely any video content for the game since it was still so new, but I did my best to learn from the few creators that were out there. Twitch was extremely useful for this, as the uncut and repeated demonstrations of optimized gameplay paired very well with the ability to ask for clarification from the streamer in real time. You'll usually see the same players over and over again, even in unranked lobbies, so you usually get the chance to run it back with someone that dunked on you. At first, there was no reason for fans of the game to watch me play. During the last two weeks of 2020, I streamed for 26 hours to an average of 2.9 viewers. It wasn't a complete waste of time because I learned a lot about streaming and how to play the game, but this is obviously an extremely inefficient way to grow as a channel. Twitch has some of the harshest discoverability across all the social media platforms. We simply don't watch new Twitch channels the way that we watch YouTubers that we're unfamiliar with. I'm going to talk about metrics a lot in this video because for one, I'm a nerd. I like numbers and spreadsheets. It's part of what drew me to Eternal Return in the first place. Two, it was my day job. I got paid to write copies, select images, and create reports for our client. I tried to take pride in my work, even if I didn't always love it, but I never took the wins or losses personally. After all, I'm just one small gear in a global economy based on the extremely accurate metrics reported by social media platforms. But with Twitch, that's me. That's my face and my words. My place and my worth. I started a new motivational tactic. When I'd take a shower, I'd grab the mirror and use the steam to write how many followers I had. I'd stare at myself through those three puny digits and think, is that all you are? Certainly, you can do better than that. You know, healthy stuff. My last day at that job was March 1st, 2021. As expected, the client did not renew their contract and I was laid off. But still, the money that was coming in for unemployment in New York State at the time really wasn't that bad. Six months of pay comparable to what I was already making? I'd never have an opportunity like this to focus on my nascent channel again. I understood that it would be naive to try to make this a full-time job before those payments ended, but what else was I gonna do other than watch Legend of the Galactic Heroes with my roommate? Get a job before the payments end? I'm trying, man. The economy's rough right now. In the merry month of March, I streamed for 89 hours to 4.4 average viewers, gaining 60 followers in the process. This type of game was something that never really clicked for me. In the summer after my junior year of high school, I played a lot of League of Legends. Zack and Wukong were my favorites, and I managed to hit Silver 3 without much instruction. Really, the only exposure I had to the game outside of my own experiences with friends was watching TSM on Twitch and Video Game Donkey on YouTube. I didn't know anyone in my grade that got out of bronze, and one day I got a call on Skype from Jeffrey, Ryan, and Brandon. Three guys I was sort of friendly with. As soon as I joined the call, the Inquisition had begun. How did you do it? As if there was some kind of cheat code that they hadn't found yet. Honestly, I didn't know how to vocalize any of what I'd learned other than I just play a lot. I tried to cap off my explanation by delicately letting them know that the rank system will almost always place them where they're meant to be. Brandon dismissively responded, You're always on some philosophical BS, bro. After this conversation, there was a new pressure during every game I played. I truthfully didn't know why I was in silver. I fell back into bronze before season 3 ended and quit the game at the end of the summer. Thankfully, I was starting to make friends in the Eternal Return community who had no problem helping me learn the game. To really get it, you have to understand the spreadsheet-like mastery system. 
Mastery is a set of several different experience bars that make it so that anything you do in the game helps you level up. If you cook a lot to raise your health mastery, your HP will go up. The more you run, the faster you move. There's hunting mastery, searching mastery, and the most important of all is your weapon mastery, which is actually more important than your character's overall level when it comes to dealing damage in a fight. A lot of new players really don't understand this, especially when combined with the useless tutorial, complex looting paths, and the intricacies of your character's matchups. Once you figure it out, it's like all the fun parts of League and Dota without the things that make those games frustrating. The looting phase is way faster and, in my opinion, more tense and engaging than laning and farming creeps. Plus, you can play ranked solo. You don't have to deal with trolls and quitters on your team. There's nobody to blame for your mistakes but yourself. As we moved through Spring 2021, Nimble Neuron was actually able to land popular streamer Lily Pichu to voice a new character that would go on to become my main, Eleven. Skara also sometimes played the game and actually befriended some of the top creators too. Another offline TV member, Michael Reeves, joined them to form a squad of three, and when they announced that they'd be streaming together, we were all really excited to see the game get some new attention in the United States. I'll show you for yourself just how that went. Hey, this is so complicated! How is anyone supposed to get into the fucking game, Skara, huh? Did you take classes on how to play? How did you find this? Was it left here by the ancient Egyptians? How did you learn to play the game? It's, if you weren't born into an herbs playing family, you don't know how to play herbs. It's, it's true. crazy. It's true. They are entitled to their opinion about the game, and obviously, he's just playing up his reaction for content. If he just flatly said, yeah, it's boring, I don't like it, that wouldn't be very funny, now would it? Anyway, at the time, that hurt to hear. Yeah, it's frustrating and difficult, but that's what makes it so satisfying when you finally master it. There's no fun if there's no challenge. By the way, he called it Herbs, which was the original title of the game, short for Eternal Return Black Survival. Eternal Return is technically the second game in this franchise, following the point-and-click, turn-based, Immortal Soul Black Survival, which featured the same characters and setting. The subtitle might sound cool to a Korean audience, but there are obviously some sensitivity issues here requiring them to drop it in the West. Just because a few popular streamers didn't show off the game the way we would have liked, doesn't mean that it's doomed. In June 2021, the vibes were actually pretty good due to the first ever Eternal Return World Invitational, which featured the top players from around the world being invited to Korea to compete for a $30,000 prize pool. Despite the games being played in the Korean time zone, we got up early to cheer for the NA reps, Team No Chef and Team USA. This was a major moment for Eternal Returns community. It was like we were the pioneers of this crazy new game, and someday its historians would look back on us and say, damn, I wish I could have seen that live. It also got the gears turning in my head. I don't have a job right now holding me back. Maybe someday I too could move to Korea. Not only did I want to see the game succeed for my own sake, but I felt I had a responsibility to my friends, mentors, and rivals to make this game as big as it could be. I wanted everyone to have the success and attention that I felt they deserve. Based on my previous experience working at that marketing agency, I felt I was uniquely prepared in both ambition and knowledge to do something nobody else could. I had a grand vision for a future that we could build together. With all this genuinely delusional pressure on my shoulders, I started to get really burnt out from my daily streaming grind. I deeply craved that big breakout that all small streamers fantasize about. The game's tournaments were always able to pull in some pretty big crowds. I actually believed this isn't for me, this is for everyone. It had to have something new though. I wouldn't accept anything less for my big debut. Rabbit House was going to organize the first ever American live event for Eternal Return. Since life was starting to get back to normal in New York City, I figured I'd pitch this idea to my friends at Wonderville. They saw how passionate I was about supporting the game's community, and offered me a Saturday night spot at their venue completely for free. Everyone at Wonderville is my hero forever. I decided to host an online-only preliminary round first, with the Eternal Return SummerSlam Finals one week later. Of course, I needed to be the face of this event from start to finish. I reached out to my friend HavoxGG, who befriended and supported me early on in my Eternal Return career to co-host. Although he was happy to help for the first week, he couldn't fly out to New York to cast the finals live. For that, I reached out to Circadia. 
I didn't know him personally at all, but I knew he was an established caster who lived near the East Coast, so I thought I'd give him an excuse to come visit New York. I was shocked at how quickly he agreed, but it completely assured me that this was a good idea. SummerSlam was a solos tournament with a $500 prize pool. There were 54 players, that's three lobbies of 18, and the top six from each group would qualify for the finals. I obviously didn't have the money to fly everybody out to New York, but I was determined to put on a good show for everyone that attended the live casting event. I studied my terminology for weeks. Each of the 33 characters has five abilities, four of them on Q, W, E, and R, and one weapon skill that's shared across all wielders of that weapon type. I would not fail. After all, I need to blow up so I can save the world. July 17th, 2021. A lot of people saw my face for the first time that night. My streams had been living in darkness for almost a full year now, and suddenly, the spotlight was on me. The 5-hour stream had an average of 327 concurrent viewers, peaking at 530. Chat said I spoke well. Chat said I was handsome. Some of those people in chat were girls. The main draw of the tournament was the players, not the casters. I don't have any delusions about that. But still, 500 people were watching my stream. Prior to that night, I had about 200 followers and had streamed for a total of 380 hours since starting my channel. In 1% of that time, I had gained over 100 more. This wasn't an act of God. I did this with my own two hands. I wanted to feel this good every time I streamed. I did a quick tech rehearsal at Wonderville a few days later, but I actually didn't have all the equipment I needed to test on hand. Surely we could just figure everything out on Saturday, right? On the night of the finals, I arrived at the venue over 90 minutes early. I figured I'd have time to get a quick bite to eat nearby before the show started. There are technological intricacies from that evening I will never understand. The cameras going into my laptop, my laptop going into the projector and soundboard, plugging in all those audio feeds into Streamlabs using alternate monitors. It's nobody's fault but mine. I had bitten off more than I can chew. I didn't run the audio tests with people in the bar and wasn't prepared for how much noise my mic would pick up. Poor Circadia was thrown right into the fire. After he finally conquered the Brooklyn subway systems and got to the venue, I immediately needed him to test everything with me for the show. I ate a bag of chips for dinner that night. We didn't start on time and people were getting confused. I pushed it back 30 minutes so we could make sure everything would be right. It wasn't. I simply wasn't ready for this. After game one, I realized the video feed was defaulting to the second screen's low quality resolution, so I was able to fix it a little, but it still looked pretty scuffed. There was too much adrenaline for me to be embarrassed. With hundreds of people watching me, I had to make peace with my failures in real time. I remember thinking, the people at home, watching this, they're not doing this. I'm doing this. And I'm trying my best. People will see that. And when this is over, I'm getting hammered with every single person that came out to support me. But even the end would not come easy. We had the stage lights on the entire time, which made it difficult to see the game being projected on the wall behind us. The live audience opted to watch the stream on their phones instead. There were still other people in the bar too that night who weren't there for the show using the Wi-Fi as well. It must have overloaded the router because during the fifth and final round of the evening, all wireless internet in the bar went out. While I was casting, Wonderville's tech producer waved me down to let me know that something wasn't right. Circadia's laptop also lost connection, so he had to look on with me, who was miraculously still going. Except it wasn't a miracle. I alone was connected through an ethernet cable. Out of all the tech mistakes I made, I did that one simple thing right. While I was manually calculating the final scores, I let any attendees from the game's community hop on the mic to give some shout outs. Fan favorite streamer Homecoming was crowned as the Knights champion and I did exactly what I said I was gonna do. The celebration had nothing to do with anyone that was watching me online. This was for the people who came out to support me in person. Circadia had some of his friends come through as well, and we were getting into all sorts of shenanigans after the cameras stopped rolling. Looking back, I kind of like the poor video quality now. It has an amateur lo-fi vibe that reminds me of that first Halloween stream. I drank a lot that night and safely stumbled my way back to my apartment. I slept well.
because I did not know that this is a story about failure. After SummerSlam, I was all in on Eternal Return. In the lazy August weeks following the big show, I did my research on how I could potentially get to Korea. They have a robust English education program with their public schools called EPIC. The money isn't great, but you get a lot of vacation time, and the government will find and pay for your apartment. Eternal Return's marketing in Korea was set to get a big change thanks to the game's new publisher. Kakao Games is a subsidiary of Kakao, a massive corporation that most of us in the West have never even heard of. Nearly everyone in Korea uses Kakao Talk as their messaging app, children can identify their several adorable corporate mascots, and their taxi and bus apps are crucial for getting around in the country. At that moment, it seemed great. They even got K-pop group Espa to do a promotional cosplay photo shoot. I had hoped that this would be the start of a larger marketing push in the United States as well. I took a little break from streaming after that tournament ended, and when I returned, the vibe had definitely changed. My regular viewership hadn't increased just yet, but I knew it was coming. I was volunteering to assist with official tournaments and making appearances on other people's streams. As I approached my one year anniversary as a streamer, I thought back to my initial goal of wanting to help people. After that Halloween event, I only did two mini charity streams, one for Dreamscape Foundation, the other for National Bailout. I felt kind of guilty for getting so far off track. Now I knew that there were people online looking out for me, believing in what I had to say. I wouldn't need to rely on my friends and family anymore to make these events successful, and I do it while knocking out a rite of passage that I could not ignore as a streamer. For my one year anniversary on September 19th, 2021, I would host a 24 hour charity stream. Starting at noon on September Saturday 18th, I'm going to be hosting a 24 hour charity marathon stream benefiting Heartcrate. Heartcrate is a nonprofit organization with the mission to provide relief, identity, and connection to children that have been impacted by trauma. I was not intimidated at all when I started streaming that day. My biggest concern was how I was going to keep eating throughout those 24 hours. In the week leading up to the event, I spoke to the organization's founder, and the support really meant a lot for them. This is why I generally avoid running streams for charities that get big donations from celebrities and businesses. Not that it would be meaningless, but anything my stream could raise would just be a drop in the bucket. With Heartcrate, they told me they would have to have a meeting to decide how to use the funds we raised. The final total was $1,735. Sure, it was a little less than the Halloween event, but this time almost all of it came from viewers. I got two massive raids during this stream and hit a new peak, 620 concurrent viewers. I thought I'd fall asleep as soon as the event ended, but the adrenaline kept me up for a few hours. I have been waiting my whole life for an opportunity like this. My story was now divided between Before Rabbit House and Anno Cunicular. When I woke up the next day, I felt something entirely new, something physical. My wrist was really sore, but that was to be expected, right? I took a one week break after the 24 hour show, celebrated my 25th birthday with my friends, and came back ready to get where I wanted to go, no matter the cost. My application was submitted to the Korean government, and I had to keep streaming to block the anxiety from my mind. It's not that I was scared to personally fail, but I didn't want to be publicly embarrassed. Both my friends in real life and the people in the Eternal Return community knew that this was an adventure I was betting everything on. I'm not really the type to have backup plans. Why would I do something that assumes my own failure? Twitch could distract my mind, but the growing pain in my wrist demanded to be acknowledged. I remember streaming ranked one night, and as I was fighting the bears at Pond, a lightning bolt shot down my middle finger. It's fine, I thought. I didn't get hit. Nobody knows that happened but me. This is the point where if my friends hit me up to hang out, I'd let them know that I'm probably going to be streaming that day instead. You obviously don't get any new followers going out to bars. And dating apps? I don't think anybody on Hinge even knows what Eternal Return is. I called it cocoon mode. I just needed to focus on grinding now so it would pay off later. My friends could understand that. I still didn't have an actual job, so I moved back in with my family to start saving for Korea. The only thing I did outside of eat, sleep, and stream was run. It's like I can work myself up, channel all these burning feelings into my legs, and just go, go, go. But these new challenges like getting ready to move, processing a global lockdown, and feeling all these expectations 
were just too heavy for me to carry. I started to cry while running, like, all the time. It's not the most unhealthy outlet for your emotions, but sometimes it would completely overwhelm me and I'd throw up on the side of the road. Usually, I'd keep going after that if I could. It just has to get done. I thought that maybe it would all go away when I got that job. Before the interview, Melly, a VTuber I met through the game, was hosting a speed date night with her chat. If you don't know, it's a fun little community hangout event where you can have a quick chat with the streamer. I was all gussied up for the interview, so I figured I'd drop in to pass the time. Her chat was so overwhelmingly positive about the way I looked. It was like an adrenaline shot of charisma right before the biggest interview of my entire life. And I was perfect. One day, two hours and 44 minutes later, I was offered a public school teaching position in South Korea. Soon, I was going to leave behind everyone and everything I've ever known for this niche game. I was so focused on getting to this point that I never really fully processed the concept of this actually happening. When I'd go to bed for the night, I'd always feel like my webcam was watching me from across the room, even if I knew my computer was turned off. My anxiety was at its worst while fighting 1v1 with a big name streamer. Now I understand that nobody cares enough about me to remember all of my little mistakes, but people were watching and I felt I had an image to protect. The stress vomiting started to happen while I was streaming, too. I would think, Connor is sick, but Rabbit House isn't. I would get up, go let it all out, sit right back down at my chair like nothing happened. My only concern was that my voice would burn out. At this point, my family was starting to get really concerned about what was going on and recommended that I go to a doctor to figure this out. I went and told him exactly what was happening and he made the proper call. There was nothing physically wrong with me, I was just going insane. I was prescribed anti-anxiety medication, something that, admittedly, I've had to use as a crutch before. Everyone is different, so don't take my experience as objective fact, but I don't really like it. Is it really right for me to dim this flame? Like, I'm stressed because I'm doing all these stressful things. It's a natural reaction to my environment. I told myself I would just take it for now. No refills. I got a new set of emotes for subscribers to use in chat and began hosting tournaments more frequently, calling them Rabbit House Rumbles. It always brought in new followers and I enjoyed giving casting opportunities to the people I thought really deserved it. The medicine was kicking in, numbing me to some of those more unpleasant thoughts, but I still feel like it clouded my judgment on certain things. For example, the number one crime that runs rampant in solos is teaming. It is a bannable offense to intentionally assist other players that should be your enemies. Of course, people get away with it all the time, and opinion is actually generally pretty mixed about whether or not it's that big of a deal. I definitely don't think it's the reason why the game isn't popular in North America. Before the final round of a five-game tournament, it was pretty obvious the player Wraith Kira would be the winner. However, there were prizes for second and third place as well, so this was an opportunity for everyone else to try to get a big pop-off game and earn enough points to win some cash. Six players in the tournament apparently were not confident enough in their ability to do that and instead decided to pick the same character, hop in voice chat together, and troll away everybody else's opportunity to compete. I, I don't even know what to call this, what's going on? Well, what are these Magnuses doing? Venom, walk up to that man. He is low, you can kill him. The thing that hurt the most about this is that I would talk to these guys pretty often. I thought they were my friends. I didn't understand why they would choose to spit in my face like that. I received several angry messages from the other competitors in the tournament, top talent that helped to draw in those big crowds. They told me if I allowed this behavior to happen, they would not be returning to my events in the future. I needed to shove down all of my personal feelings and do what I felt was best for the game. After apologizing to everyone playing and watching this tournament, those six players were disqualified and suspended from participating in Rabbit House Rumble 3. That made sense, however, I really regret the way that I handled it afterwards. I tried to play it off with those guys like it didn't bother me and that it was a good thing that this happened because it got people talking about my stream. Some of that community spirit we saw during the summer started to subside and the vibe was getting a little bit more clicky. I was afraid if I came down hard on them, it would alienate me from their friends and viewers. Teaming controversy wasn't particularly rare. A few weeks prior, there was a pretty major ban wave because the game added a replay feature. Players that would try to study the pros quickly found that there was a lot of this behavior happening, and several big names were disqualified from playing in the Fall Championship Series. 
Tournament organizers frequently need to deal with bad behavior from players, because let's be real, the community is made up of people insane enough to play this game. And coincidentally, right after Kakao got involved, official tournaments for NA had become less and less frequent, so at times it felt like community events were the only thing holding us together. I can't go back and do it over again, but I wish I stuck up for myself a little bit more. In a way, this was the push that I needed to remind myself that not everybody is going to see the vision the same way as me. Shortly after that, I stopped taking the anxiety medication. It was a cold, dry December without much snow. At least I think it was. I was so focused on streaming and getting my visa that I didn't really take much time to look out the window. After all my hard work, I was finally in a position where I'd casually start streaming and suddenly have 50 people watching me. Imagine 50 people physically sitting in your room with you, simultaneously watching you play video games on your computer. I could not let something as simple as wrist pain slow me down, so I bought a carpal tunnel brace, although it didn't really do much. Christmas was coming up, and I felt sad knowing it was probably the last time I was going to spend it with my family for a while. It was a sacrifice I would have to make for my dream of working at Nimble Neuron. I thought I'd be able to get some type of power that I could never achieve as a content creator if I was there. Teaching English would just be my ticket into the country. This was not a secret. If you knew that Rabbit House was moving to Korea, you probably knew why. In fact, a lot of you were cheering me on. And that praise tasted so, so sweet. And when I spoke to people at Nimble Neuron, it seemed like it would be a real possibility that I could work there someday. I wanted to do something totally different to close out the year, and I thought of no better use of my specific talents than an awards show. I had accepted that I would never be a top player, especially when considering all the damage I did to my wrist. Charm is just another form of crowd control. I wanted to show off all the different people I found fascinating. With that, the Lumi Awards were born. Everyone could submit their nominations for categories like Funniest Streamer, Coolest Moment, or Best Voice. After a few weeks, we voted again on the top six finalists to choose the winners. They'd be announced at the 2021 Lumi Awards, hosted by myself and Irene, on December 23rd. I added the year to the title because I knew no matter what, I was going to do it again in 2022. This was, by far, the biggest collaboration I've ever organized. A ton of people were talking about it, and it was pretty common to see streamers filling out their ballots while sitting in ranked queue. I wanted to celebrate all the passion, all the hard work, all the people that made this game's community special. And I found a way to place myself right at the center of it. I wasn't getting sick from anxiety anymore. I always knew that if I kept going, I would adjust. I was ready to be Rabbit House now. But there was one ominous warning, always in the back of my mind. I can't get into specific details about this, but at some point between my event in New York and the Lumi Awards, I ended up having a very curious conversation with someone that knew what was happening behind the scenes at Nimble Neuron. And no, it's not the guy that just popped into your head. They gave me a lot of very sobering information, alleging that the management was incompetent, turnover rate was high, and that almost no money was being spent on marketing. Most importantly, they said they were telling me this because they didn't want to see me mess up my life choices. Content creators have to make countless decisions about their work, but never once did I think that this game was the wrong path entirely. They told me never to tell anyone, and I've kept my word about it until now. The night of the Lumi Awards, my mom did my hair, I wore the tux that I got for my junior prom in 2013, and I switched on that classic rabbit house smile. The show must go on. Um, I just wanted to do something really sweet and uh, give oh. you a nice, nice gift this Christmas. Oh. That, that looks, those are really cute. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I, see, I see how it is, Connor. You're just trying to get into my, uh, get my address so you can stalk me IRL. So. Oh, true, true. <laughs> <laughs> my departure was less than 50 days away. I was finally granted a one-year teaching visa and I bought a new suit because I didn't know how formal teachers were expected to dress. I was itching to start this new job so that my master plan could finally move forward. I wouldn't be allowed to jump right in, however, as there were still some safety regulations about entering the country. Specifically, I'd have to stay in a hotel in Seoul for 10 days. It didn't sound too bad. I was happy that my arrival was during the cold month of February rather than missing out on any beautiful spring weather. The tricky part is that the hotel stay would come on my own dime. Ever since my unemployment payments ended back in September, I had been seriously hemorrhaging money. What's the harm in wanting a little something for myself? 
Of course, this was all for the greater good of Eternal Return. The money I needed to get into the country was just a small price to pay for all the important work I was going to do in Korea. I hosted my first and only subathon. This event was kind of like my NA going away party. I bought not one, but two rabbit costumes. Six bottles of soju as well. I joked that the only way I would wear that bunny girl costume is if I was drunk, but honestly, I would have done far more humiliating things stone cold sober if I thought it would support the community. I wasn't particularly hungover the next day, but there was a new weight in my stomach that I really didn't like. People around the world gave me personally $1,000 so that I could achieve my dream of going to Korea and working for this game. I cannot screw this up. I have been painting myself as the savior for this game the entire time. And ready or not, it's happening. February 10th, 2022. Even as I was arriving at the airport, I couldn't really process what was happening. I've never even gone more than a month without seeing my family. And now I'd be on the other side of the world for over a year. First, I flew from New York to Dallas. And during my layover, there was an introductory meeting between the new English-speaking community managers at Kakao and some of the respected names in the tournament organizing scene. I sat in the call muted, listening to my friends plead for more support while I ate my last meal in America, a McDonald's cheeseburger. I thought the conversation went well, and it seemed like Kakao was interested in what we had to say, but I didn't think too much about whether or not anything would come from it. I was so sure that nobody could see it quite like me. In Korea, there would be no limits and no excuses. They called my group number and I walked up to the gate. Everything that was going to happen on the other side was waiting for me to start it. I got on the plane and the plane flew away. When I stepped outside, it all seemed so bright and definitely cleaner than LaGuardia. I actually made it. After clearing customs, government employees wearing white hazmat suits put us on a bus and brought us to the quarantine hotel. I knew this was how they were gonna take us, but it all still felt way too much like Squid Game for my liking. The drive from Incheon Airport to Seoul is over an hour, giving us new teachers some time to chat. I was surprised at how many of them came from countries that weren't the United States, like Australia and Ireland. It got dark out during the ride over, giving Seoul this cool cyberpunk vibe from the other side of the Han River. We had a little mix-up at the hotel's front desk, but I already told that story in the first video I posted on this channel. I passed the time playing Pokemon Legends Arceus and catching up on Let's Fight a Boss. When I got sick of looking at a screen, I'd either study Hangul, the Korean alphabet, or stare out at the city skyline. I'd look into the distance and wonder, just how far is Nimble Neuron's office from where I am right now? Surprisingly, the food was the worst part. I love Korean food, but the cold, prepackaged meals they left at our door three times a day was not it. I had to think of some creative ways to heat them up, like submerging the entire plastic container in hot sink water. Afterwards, we were all shipped off for a brief orientation at Jungwon University. I have a vlog for that too. And then finally, I was told my new address. I already knew I'd be in the South Gyeongsang province, but they keep the actual location of your home and school a secret until you arrive. In the past, teachers would sometimes quit early when they found out they were being stuck somewhere excessively rural. I was told I'd be outside of a city called Changwon, an ecologically friendly place with electric buses, home to the NC Dinos baseball team. It sounded great, but my actual apartment was in a place called Gamgye, a tiny little persimmon farming town. For the next year, this would be my home. My apartment was a little smaller than a typical one bedroom in New York, but I couldn't complain. It was my first time living without roommates, and my rent was entirely covered by the Korean government. I arrived on Friday, February 25th, and my unit had actually been empty for the past month, meaning the gas was turned off, meaning no heat. The company in charge couldn't come fix it until after the weekend. Even worse, I wouldn't have Wi-Fi in my apartment for a full week, and the American SIM card in my phone wasn't working the way that it should. I'm really in it now. This is so much fun! 
When I woke up the next morning, getting food was my top priority. I had some Korean money in my wallet and I knew how to say, please give me. Ju seyo. I wanted to try some authentic Korean fried chicken, so I walked around Gamgye on a sunny Saturday afternoon looking for somewhere good. I remember thinking, wow, look at all of these family restaurants. There's no McDonald's or Starbucks anywhere. Only to find out later that most of them were chains, I just couldn't recognize it as an American. I decided on Kyocheon since there wasn't a long line for me to hold up with my truly atrocious Korean skills. I walked up to the counter and did my best. Manil chicken juseyo. Ne. I did it. It worked. I could do anything. Young Sujung Dilkayo. Gwenchana yo. They fried up everything for me right there on the spot, and when I finally got a taste of that crispy Korean fried chicken, I was just hoping that I didn't turn down anything important. After a weekend of ice cold showers, Monday finally came, and I had my first opportunity to check out my new school. The weight of my new job had kind of been lost on me throughout this entire process. Eternal return was what brought me here, but now I was going to be somebody's teacher. One month ago, I was wearing rabbit costumes on the internet like some kind of digital jester. And now I'd be playing the part in the educational development of hundreds of children. And wow, those kids. When school finally started, all of those kids were interested in hearing more about their new English teacher, Mr. Connor. My first lesson for all grades was a simple introduction followed by an open Q&A translated by the Korean co-teacher. I quickly learned to love giving my students opportunities to indulge their natural curiosity. I'm strange and different to them, so they want to ask me questions. Mr. Connor, do you have a gun? Teacher, did you vote for Donald Trump? Teacher, is Dokdo a Korean island? How tall are you? Do you have a girlfriend? What games do you play? Do you like kimchi? Within a matter of days, it was impossible for me to walk silently through the hallway. Everywhere I went, a swarm of excited Korean school children followed. They also all loved Among Us. I once told a third grader that the game they loved so much was actually made in America. He was thrilled. There's an Among Us video game? Because I knew they were waiting for me, getting up and going to work was way easier than any job I've ever had. Back on Lumia Island, we started the year strong with a ton of major announcements. Nimble Neuron inked a new partnership with the Gen G esports organization to help promote the game in the United States. And there was a new game mode announced, Cobalt Protocol. Instead of the usual crafting-based battle royale, this would be a new 4v4 experience similar to League of Legends ARAM mode. When I first heard the pitch, I thought it would be a useful bridge for new players to better understand the game's characters and controls before moving on to the more difficult fundamentals. It was fun for a little while and gave the player count a temporary boost, but it gets stale quickly and while writing this script I heard they're actually already trying to revamp it. On the Korean server, the best of the best were preparing for the Eternal Return Masters Tournament Series. Usually, only players within the country, or maybe Japan, would compete. This time, Nimble Neuron was looking for international representatives to play remotely since the 2022 World Invitational was cancelled. I got a message from GM Haley at Nimble Neuron about it, and she gave me two choices. I could either play in the event myself as NA's representative, or I could restream the tournament to my channel. I was a good choice to play since I didn't have to deal with the high connection latency someone in the United States would face while playing on the Korean server. Even if my arm and wrist were at 100%, those Korean pros would have slaughtered me. It was an obvious business decision about what I was supposed to do here. The tournament filled my chat with fans of the different regional representatives, Lakni for NA, Nero for the Philippines, and Trick for the EU. It immediately validated this entire Korea project, as nobody was ever given the opportunity to officially restream a Korean tournament like this. Soon after the event, I hit 1,000 followers and was given the coveted title of Eternal Return Partner, which, back then, was reserved for only the most well-known streamers in the community. As the weather warmed up, I started running again to explore my little town. I had so much energy, everything was going my way. I hit a brand new peak in life and the view was incredible. The timing coincided perfectly with Luffy reaching Gear 5 in One Piece. This is an excerpt from my personal journal dated March 25th, 2022. My brief haphazard life, which only exists due to medicine and science from the past 50 years, 
should only be spent uniting people and bringing smiles to those in pain. I don't know if I'd ever be able to achieve everything, but I have to try. There must always be something moving me forward. I want to inspire and lead and help and prove to myself that's who I am. I don't have the right words for it since it's such a simple feeling, but it's huge and all I can ever see for myself. This exact image with his silhouette against the moon really stuck with me, so I drew it in the journal too. Big talk for such a tiny rabbit. Russia's invasion of Ukraine was all over my timeline, and when I saw it, I immediately knew what I had to do. The plan was to host the fifth and final Rabbit House Rumble as a charity invitational tournament. All the top players knew who I was at that point, and I was pleasantly surprised at how eager and grateful they were to be included. I invited Adri Toma to co-cast with me, with Noxibun reading out the donations people made to Project Hope's humanitarian aid efforts. I gave $56 as the event's first donation, matching the number you always see Luffy wear on his shirts in the color spreads. In total, we raised $3,655, like that. This new power that I had, there was only one word for it, magic. After that, my streaming schedule slowed down a little bit so that I could focus more of my time after school on studying Korean. It's such a well-designed and precise and beautiful language. Sometimes I would even pick up words subconsciously during my daily life, hear them in my dreams, even though I don't know what they mean. I thought that if I could pass Topic, Test of Proficiency in Korean, Nimble Neuron would have no excuse not to hire me. Plus, I wanted to understand my students at school. They were telling me all these funny things, but I just didn't speak enough Korean to really connect with them like that. In April, the honeymoon feeling between me and Korea started to wear off, but that's to be expected. I started to feel kind of homesick and got more anxious about the future. Sometimes I'd catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror and think, why can't you just be normal? Why do you have to do all of these things just to feel good about yourself? No time to unpack all that, because on May 4th, I used my vacation time to leave school a little bit early and make my return trip to Seoul. We had a long weekend due to Children's Day and Buddha's birthday, and yeah, there's a vlog for that too, but this one's kind of important, so we're gonna talk about it again. After Aesop introduced me to Rockadoodle, the best chicken sandwich I'll ever eat in my life, he took me on a tour of the Nimble Neuron office. I'd never been inside any type of game dev studio before, and it was way nicer than the place I used to work at in New York. The office was so big, so clean, so modern. I was talking to one of the devs about the future of Eternal Return, and he mentioned a name that I wasn't quite familiar with, Martina. He immediately caught himself and said, oh, I wasn't supposed to tell you about that yet. I assured him that there was no problem. Of course, Someday Nimble Neuron was going to trust me with secrets far more important than that. I would have liked to stay one more day in Seoul, but on Sunday morning I had to cast the Gen G end of season cup, and I didn't feel like bringing all my audio equipment with me. Gen G made this feel way more professional than anything I had done up to this point. We had a formal tech rehearsal the day before, and their staff was ready to make everything look perfect. It was me, Circadia, and Shuvi Senpai on the mic, our first triple cast together, with Yuki Usada helping behind the scenes. After we finished the walkthrough, one of their employees said something that really stuck with me. He called us for the pillars of the community. The old guard was gone now. This is our era. I had really missed casting for NA. It's just so much more fun when I personally know the players I'm talking about. I've gone out drinking with some of them, and others I've stayed up late nights watching Netflix with over Discord. Of course I'm gonna scream when I see them doing well. In the chat though, there were plenty of names I didn't recognize. That's a good thing though, right? This game needs new players. Most of them already knew who I was. I mean, how could they not? Rabbit House was the guy who moved to Korea to do this. But in between matches, when our faces would come back on screen, I didn't like the things I was reading. So many of you kept using this empty word over and over again. Shad. That praise used to taste so sweet, but every piece of gum eventually loses its flavor. It's not a big deal. I don't really care. The thing that really pissed me off was the way you were talking about the two guys casting alongside me. People started making and sharing memes about how we looked. Seeing them so callously put my friends down like that made me realize the praise is just as empty as the insults. Chat? The community? This is a faceless blob of my own imagination. A hornet's nest of psychic syringes pumping chemicals, good and bad, directly into my brain. 
Don't talk about us like you know us. The tournament eventually ended. I forgot how many people were watching and I don't care enough to look it up. Afterwards, I went to my local grocery store, got some gimbap, and did my laundry. When I took a look at my calendar, I realized I had committed to doing a lot of casting in the next few weeks. All of which paid in exposure. My goal was to channel this passion into making my dream career, but right now, it just felt like work. Genji reached out to me after the show to offer me a gift package including a hoodie. I gave them my American address and my Korean address and said, ship it to wherever is more convenient for you. The package never arrived at either destination. On the weekends I wasn't casting, I was going to baseball games, trying new food, and making new friends, both Koreans and foreigners. When people would ask me why I was in Korea, I would answer honestly. When I explained my channel, I could tell they weren't interested in hearing everything about it. Not that I was being self-absorbed or even worse, boring, but it just wasn't why they were friends with me. They liked Connor and didn't care about who or what a rabbit house was. Instead of DMing the girls that I thought were cool and asking if they ever wanted to play together on stream, I could just sit down with a normal human being, get a coffee, and talk about something that wasn't video games. I met with a woman in her early 30s on the language exchange app HelloTalk. I dressed the way I thought a teacher should dress on weekends and took the bus down to Changwon City Hall to meet her. She said she drove here and that she could take me to a place called Machang Daegyo, which was way nicer than the packed city center. I had never heard of it before. Despite the constant warnings I received growing up, I met a stranger on the internet and immediately got into their car. We had a very pleasant Sunday afternoon down by the bridge, although the spring heat made me wish I wore something a little bit lighter than the thick white shirt I had on. She taught me how to use gendered pronouns properly in the Korean language, and we walked by a bunch of food trucks, but I didn't get anything because the takoyaki and Nutella crepes I wanted were way too messy and I would not have looked dignified eating it. When the sun set, she drove me for over an hour back to my apartment. I was surprised to hear that she was still living with her family. She said it wasn't as common to move out from your folks in Korea before getting married. As we pulled up, she looked at me and said, I'm glad we met because you're not a pervert. I didn't understand what she meant by that. We only saw each other once more after that, and while I was making this video, I saw her on Instagram with a guy that seemed like he might be her boyfriend. I was genuinely happy for her when I saw it. I hope she's able to move out soon. My sights were still set on Nimble Neuron, but I didn't feel the need to actually play the game anymore. When I first started streaming, it challenged me and forced me to evolve. I could keep pushing to get higher and higher numbers, but I knew it wouldn't hit the same. Attention on the internet is like taking a bath with an open drain. You think you can relax in that warm, calming water, but the second you close your eyes, it's all gone. Now I understand, you also need me to validate you. The idea of an American guy uprooting his life, moving to Korea to be an esports caster, is a highly alluring fantasy for someone feeling stuck or trapped in their own life. Watching that first World Invitational, I saw exactly what I wanted to see. The infinite video content on the internet lets us feel what isn't ours, revel in glory that we did not earn. If you grew up online like me, your mental chemistry is probably so biologically linked to your smartphone that it's like a pancreas grafted to your brain. A cybernetic parasite forced upon our entire species, Also, that big tech companies can pretend their stock prices are worth what you see on the screen. And when my channel took off, I was fully captivated by the opposite side of this process. Viewers look at me together through a telescope of what I show them, and I imagine them based on the little dots I see from the other side. That is the reverse panopticon experience of life as a content creator. I just needed to keep up this sprint a little while longer. I couldn't stand the thought of people not seeing me make it after I tried so hard. This anxiety dominated my mind all the time, and I hated myself for it. One late night, with school starting just a few hours later, I let this thought torture me until I felt it in my stomach. I grabbed my phone and announced on Discord a full hiatus of all my channel's events, just so I could fall asleep that night. From this point forward, I would do exactly what I thought Nimble Neuron would like me to do. No more, no less. During the weekend of July 10th, 2022, I stayed at a tiny Airbnb near Kyungsung University in Busan. It wasn't only for fun though, that Sunday I'd be seeing the Topic exam. 
There are five potential ranks spread across two exams. I was aiming for Topic Level 2. The night before the test, I met with Kyoya. He showed me some cool spots on Guangali Beach, like this rooftop bar with a balcony. When we went to a spot called Thursday Party, a group of Korean dudes were so hyped to see two blonde guys walk in that they invited us over to their table immediately. Before we even got there, they were pouring us tequila shots. They seemed roughly about my age, and when I told them I had a big test tomorrow, the most sober one among them loudly reassured me. Oh, don't worry about it. That test is just a piece of gum. He was right. The hardest part was actually filling out that massive scantron with my messed up hand. I came to this country not even knowing how to pronounce its basic alphabet, and in less than six months, I got the higher grade on the basic proficiency exam. There was no way Nimble Neuron would be able to turn me down when my teaching contract finishes early next year. If you've never been to the south coast of Korea during the summertime, you don't even know the meaning of the word sipki. Stepping out from an air-conditioned building and into the world is like walking through a waterfall of hot misutgaru. I definitely couldn't run in my town anymore, and we didn't even have a gym, so I didn't have access to a treadmill. I tried nengmyeon and patbingsu, necessary staples of yolum in hanguk. Much like the United States, summer means schools out in Korea, although only for the month of August. Part of the gig as an epic teacher means I have to run Summer English Camp, an optional program for students looking to get some extra practice. According to my manager, signups had doubled compared to the previous year. Mr. Connor was putting all the effort he normally would be using for streaming into making the summer camp world tour. Every day, those kids were going to learn about a new country, play some themed games, and at the end of the day, make a special snack. And on Friday, English movie day. It wasn't all easy for me because this was something that I'd have to run on my own. No Korean co-teacher in the room with me helping me translate. I just passed the topic exam, but that's for listening and reading, receptive skills only. My pronunciation still wasn't great, and you're supposed to slur the final consonant, or bachim, onto the next syllable if it starts with a vowel, a habit that's hard to form through studying in a book. And if you sound funny when you talk to kids, they'll laugh. On Wednesday, we learned about Italy. My favorite activity was the Spaghetti Tower Challenge. I split the students up into random groups and give each one a pack of spaghetti and a bag of mini marshmallows. The group that can build the highest tower wins. The catch? Only speaking English. If I hear Korean, I'll subtract one centimeter from the final measurement. I usually let it slide the first time they mess up. They are just kids after all. The winning team gets to be first in line for the snack that day. Pizza toast. And if you're really good and help Mr. Connor clean up, you get to eat some of those marshmallows too. Uribini. Those kids loved English camp so much, they started showing up early to draw pictures on the whiteboard together. It felt like a crime to erase them at the end of the week. I casted a few different tournaments that summer, but I could tell that even Nimble Neuron was getting less excited about bringing Korean events to an English-speaking audience. It wasn't a guarantee that we would get the graphics and overlays from them on time. And once they hit me up like, Hey, the tournament's starting soon, where are you? Despite me making it clear that I wasn't going to be available that day. Based on my personal observations and experiences, North American Eternal Return is and will always be an afterthought from the perspective of this Korean company. Don't they know Americans buy skins too? I did one more Gen G tournament as well, and while casting the wildcard round with my man Spark, the stream surpassed 1,000 live viewers. Just six months ago, a number like that would have sent me to bed with the stupidest grin on my face. But now, it means nothing. I actually did get paid for this one though, a $100 Visa gift card instead of a gift package that never came. I used it to buy Tunic on Steam and spent the rest on my trips to Busan. I was there almost every weekend at this point. There was really nothing left for me to do in that little persimmon town. Plus, something big was coming to Busan, and I had to be a part of it. I messaged my primary contact at Nimble Neuron, and he was happy to send me an invitation. Hey everybody, Rabbit House here. I hope you've been enjoying your summer. I got this curious letter in the mail the other day, and I'm so excited to finally be able to announce that I will be attending the Eternal Return Masters Tournament in Busan, August 12th through 14th. It must have been really boring waiting on that long line to get in. Those of us with the VIP pass, we wouldn't know anything about that. I got to sit with all the cosplayers down in the special viewing area. 
On paper, the reason I was there was to make a vlog for the game's YouTube channel. But after everything I've shown you about who I am as a person, you know that I just can't resist hamming it up. Before the tournament started, I got to introduce myself to the Korean casting team, as well as the pro players. I'd been watching their games for months now, but I couldn't identify them by their faces. When the competition began, I knew exactly who they were, what character they would pick, and how they would approach the game. At one point, the arena cam put me and my sign on the screen. I really liked Shuvi's reaction when it popped up on the broadcast. The first three games were already a blast, man. What are you really... Oh my god, Let's go. I, said, I said I said, I was gonna do it. There he is, it's Rabbit House. Look at that right now. Of course, he's sitting there. Show the pride of North America. It, the sign says, by the way, North America loves Eternal Return. QA ranked buff Lennox and shout out to NA cast. I actually wanted to write that line from before. Americans buy skins too, but in Korean. But I didn't want to piss off my future employer. By the end of the weekend, I was already thinking about the 2022 Lumi Awards. It was going to be the perfect finale to my shining career. One last ride as a community, and at the start of 2023, I'd finally achieve my dream of working for Nimble Neuron. Man plans, God laughs. I had the last two weeks of August completely off from school, and I tried to start playing again just to brush up on everything I missed. My arm would not heal. In fact, the pain started creeping up into my shoulder. Summer vacation ends a little bit earlier for teachers, and I came into desk warm on those lazy days without any classes. But on August 29th, I received a shocking reminder that this world does not revolve around me. Nimble Neuron posted a job opening on LinkedIn. The title was Localization and Community Specialist. This was exactly what I was waiting for, and it was happening right now. With my breath held, I submitted my application. The air was charged. The sky was pink. Something was coming. I soon found out from one of my co-teachers that a typhoon was rumbling straight towards Changwon. The principal preemptively canceled classes for the next day. That night, I watched the trees of Gamye get torn limb from limb. As someone that grew up on Long Island, I've experienced my fair share of hurricanes, but it was still kind of scary to see news footage of waves crashing into city streets. What shocked me the most was how quick everything was cleaned up afterwards. When Sandy hit in 2012, me and my friends were climbing on fallen trees for days. In less than 48 hours, you wouldn't have a single clue that a storm just tore this town apart. The typhoon had broken the summer heat, and spending time outside started to become bearable again. My landlady received a big harvest of persimmons and shared some with me. I assumed the storm knocked them off the trees. It was my first time trying one, despite living in a town with gum in its name for the past six months. I still don't really know how to slice it though. It has the perfect mild sweetness, and I read online that it's actually good for inflammation. I was doing pretty much everything I could for my arm, except for the one thing that it actually needed. Uninterrupted and extended rest. On September 22nd, 2022, I turned 26 years old. If I failed to get this job, there would be no health insurance waiting for me when I came home. Four days after my birthday, I reached out to one of their GMs on Discord. As I get to this part of the video, in order to protect myself, I can't show you the exact conversation. Instead, let's imagine how that maybe might have went. They told me they forwarded my resume to the community manager, but they're looking at another candidate because they could speak Korean. I could not believe what I was reading. I submitted my Topic score with my application. How did they not see that? The response made my blood boil. I don't really know anything about Topic. Do you think you could translate Korean to English? Maybe then I could talk to him about it. He actually asked me how good your Korean is, and I told him not good enough to translate Korean to English. If you're not familiar with Topic, why would you tell your boss that my Korean isn't good enough? You have no idea who I am and what I am capable of. I am Rabbit House Games. I can do anything. Not like this. There is a combination of words that I can say that will get me out of this situation. They are all already inside my mind. All I have to do is put them together in the right order. This is what I said. Three excruciating minutes later, they replied. Oh, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you could start working here next year? 
My stomach sank. I knew exactly what he meant by that. I reiterated that I was on a teaching contract tied to the Korean school year. Sounds good. I'll let them know about this. I believe we need somebody that could start working right away. My next thought splattered my brain as if it were hit by a baseball bat. I didn't have to stay at my school. Breaking my contract would probably get me banned from teaching in the country again, but it's not like they'd send me back to jail. This was only supposed to be my entry ticket into Korea. I have a mission that I must complete. This can't all be for nothing. I gave a vague but professional response to buy me some time and desperately tried to think of a way that I could make this work. I got one final tip from someone else in the know. If you think this is your shot, it's now or never. Two years of pleasure and pain culminating in this final climax. If I left that school, there would be no English teacher there next year. And even worse, all those kids. I'd be shattering all of their little hearts. We just had so much fun at summer camp together. Jessica, who was always so fresh to her homeroom teacher, but liked to give me little gifts. Timmy, whose favorite One Piece character is Kizaru. Simon, who wrote me a letter asking if we could have English class every day. Artemis and her beautiful animal drawings. David and the NC Dino's cap he always wears. To land my dream job, I needed to leave them all behind and never look back. There wasn't even a decision to be made. In that moment, I wasn't Rabbit House. I was Mr. Connor. And Mr. Connor would never abandon his students like that. This is a story about failure. A dream wholeheartedly pursued until the day it died. I could have tried to keep going, ignoring what was right in front of me the same way I did so many times leading up to this. But deep down, I knew it was true. I gave this everything I had, and it just wasn't in the cards. I lost. Game over. I took my webcam off my laptop. I put my ring light under my bed. My microphone dismantled completely. Rabbit House quit. A few weeks later, I was contacted by the same GM. That was the last real conversation I had with anybody at Nimble Neuron. I guess a position just never opened up. That fall, when I watched the nature around me die, it felt like it would never come back. My co-teachers could tell I wasn't really paying attention in class. I was seeing someone, but we broke up. When I would make a simple and innocent mistake, say, dropping some papers in front of my students, in my mind, I would call myself some very bad words. I was gonna miss Thanksgiving that year, all because I had to play hero on the computer. I just wanted to watch football with my cousins and hang out with my sister and eat so much obscure American food that nobody around me in Korea had ever even heard of. I tried to distract myself with the buggy, unpolished mess called Pokemon Scarlet. Every few years, the excitement of a new generation could always take me back to being a kid. But now, that little boy is gone. I opened up submissions for the 2022 Lumi Awards, but I didn't check them and I didn't feel like doing it. I was ashamed to show my face because I let everyone down. I thought failing like this was the worst thing that could happen to me in Korea. But remember that big thing that went down in 2020? I know we all pretend that it's over, but it's not. And right when you least expect it. Cold, scared, alone. I was bedridden for three days. All I felt was pain and fear. My heart is different from other people's. I'm considered at risk. I don't know what's going to happen. This feels like the end. And all these little games mean nothing to me now. Because someday, I will die, and everyone I love is going to die too. So instead of chasing fake rabbits, 
let's move closer towards saying what we really mean. Yesterday, when I woke up to film chapters 3 and 4 of this video, I noticed I had this little cut on my forehead. I was really upset that it happened today of all days, and I put some cover up on it before getting to work. But last night, when I was thinking about it, I thought, that's not why I'm making this video. I'm done pretending that I don't bleed. In the summer after 5th grade, my family started attending our local Lutheran church. I sat still and paid attention very well in Saturday school. I liked to sing hymns on Sunday morning, but I was terrified of people hearing me make a mistake. I had to follow all the rules because I didn't want to go to hell. On Friday nights, our community would make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the local homeless shelter. I usually did this while sitting with my best friend at youth group, a homeschooled girl with short red hair. I could tell that she liked me a lot, but when we spoke, I couldn't do it while maintaining eye contact. One day, we were standing together in church, and with Christ himself looking down upon us, she asked for the reason why I kept doing that. I didn't know why. Shame was just the natural reaction. I deeply felt, but could not understand, the doctrine of original sin. Humans are born imperfect and impure, and we must cleanse ourselves of our nature. I have walked through life, blinded and strangled by the ancient generational curse called self-repression. A few years later, before my confirmation, my body and thoughts began to change, and it made me very uncomfortable. I didn't want God to hear my internal monologue anymore. It was like I wasn't safe to be myself inside my own mind. Why would the good Lord make me this way? When I was 15, I decided for the sake of my own sanity, I needed to stop believing in God. But even that would not set me free. If I could have unplugged myself a little bit and really tried to connect with the people around me, maybe I would have come to a healthier understanding of what it means to be human. Instead, my entire life, I've been staring at screens and boxing with shadows in the glass prison of my own mind. I thought the answer must be found by looking inward. It's my fault I'm not perfect. The reason I couldn't look into those calm, green eyes was because it would force me to confront that I wasn't God's perfect little boy. I was just some kid. Kids have weird feelings and get confused and want to be liked because kids are just small humans, an animal species highly prone to losing track of what's important. We close our eyes and drill down deep into our own minds desperately seeking the things that are right in front of us. In 2020, like many of you, I was lonely and frustrated. I hated myself for being so whiny and powerless in a time of global crisis. This new thing that's spreading around the world killing people, of course that's gonna make me upset. Of course there's nothing I can do to stop it. That's just being human. I wasn't satisfied with just collecting donations from my family and friends. No, I needed to be something more. I had to transcend my humanity. Streaming gave me an outlet to feed my own image in a way that I could rationalize as pure and virtuous. All the feelings I tried to stuff down for years came gushing out and carried me away. I swung so far, so fast, from sinner to saint, that I ended up nailing myself to a cross for some stupid video game. And when I caught a glimpse of death himself, I learned it doesn't matter what items you have or how much you've grinded your speed stat. He is the final boss, a mandatory encounter nobody can overcome. Death completes and unites us all, returning us to what we were before. I obviously didn't understand all of this right away. It's probably something I'm going to be untangling for the rest of my life. But the way I feel when I'm with other people, working to make our shared dreams into reality, this is what I know to be my soul. It is possible to transcend your humanity, and you do it by filling this world with so much honest love that your will persists long after you're dead. I am human, and the only thing I wanted this entire time was to live hand in hand with someone else so we don't get lost in the dark. 
This bond protects the world. It creates the future. I wasn't able to keep my promise about being the savior Lumia Island was waiting for, but I could still go down in history as its greatest showman. I wanted to end this right with a proper goodbye at the 2022 Lumi Awards. This would be the grand finale of Rabbit House Games, one final charity stream. There was a cause I never got around to supporting on my channel, and at the end of it all, this was the perfect way to honor my namesake. In 2018, my father was diagnosed with intraocular melanoma, cancer of the eye. When he first told us, I didn't allow myself to be afraid. We have doctors and modern medicine, this would go away. Five years of remission later, I understand that when it's happening to you, it's not so simple. Death is a terrifying unknown. It's our natural instinct to run from it. I couldn't even imagine what my parents went through hearing that their first baby would need open heart surgery, sending me off to fight a battle none of us could understand. When I set all my streaming equipment back up, it all seemed so simple and obvious, like a set of blocks that babies try to fit into correctly shaped holes. I know I was never some huge streamer that broke out from my niche, but I got a hell of a lot further than nearly everyone else that started from zero on Twitch. There was only one more thing I wanted to accomplish. When I added up all the money I raised for charity over the years, it was a few hundred bucks shy of $10,000. This was always supposed to be about helping people. That's why I started this journey. Admittedly, my brain was still pretty fried when I finally went live again. But seeing all those familiar names in my chat one more time reminded me of why this community is so special and why I fought so hard to support them. Hosting a charity stream is like doing a trust fall. And every single time, people around the world were there to catch me. I will be grateful for that for the rest of my life. So many of you truly are my friends, and you've been working hard to support this game in your own unique way from the very beginning. I did two whole awards shows, and I still feel like there are people that are unsung heroes. I know I'm leaving this community in good hands. For the people that donated, I decided to raffle off the Eternal Return merch I got over the past year, exclusive artifacts from the far off land known as KR. And when it was all over, we raised $1,253 for the Eye Cancer Foundation, bringing my lifetime total to $10,056.96. Not bad for a rabbit that started this journey with only four followers. It was an incredible moment, but to be honest, I was still beating myself up over not getting that job. Now I had to go home, and I didn't know who I was going to be when I got back. I wasn't leaving Korea just yet though. I still had a few more weeks with my students and I wanted to enjoy every last moment of being a teacher. I started announcing at the end of our weekly classes that next year, someone else would be your English teacher. Mr. Connor loves Korea, but he misses his friends and family and they miss him too. It's time for me to go home. Thank you for all your hard work. I told them where to find me in my office after school and said that they could come visit at any time. That day, there were lines down the hallway. You would think that Jungkook himself was waiting on the other side of that door. They all wanted to take a picture with me on their hand-me-down Samsung Galaxy phone. And after they did, I would give them a type of cookie that they've never seen before. My mother's Linzer tarts, biscottis, and rainbow cookies that she mailed me for Christmas. On February 8th, 2023, I watched my 6th graders graduation ceremony. I wore a suit because I knew parents would be in attendance that day. I cried and cried and cried because I knew that this was the end. When I saw the parents doing the same, I wondered just how much deeper is what they're feeling compared to me? Are my feelings even 0.1% of what they're experiencing right now? It's weird that I'm even thinking about this stuff because back in America, I never imagined myself as somebody that could be a parent someday. I invited all my foreign friends over and let them pick from my stuff what they wanted to keep. I hope Robin and San are enjoying that big jar of Jiffy peanut butter I got imported. It was especially sad to leave my fellow Weigukin. Foreigners are not common in Changwon the way that they are in Seoul. When we speak English to our Korean co-teachers, we have to really focus on making sure they can understand us. For expats, it's a rare treat to speak your native language at its natural speed. When we meet up for drinks, we're constantly yelling over each other just to get it all out. On February 25th, 
I loaded everything I wasn't leaving for the next English teacher into my suitcase and went to Busan for one last visit. I planned to stay there for about a week since I had some time to kill. At the beginning of March, my parents, sister, and her boyfriend were coming to visit Seoul, and even better, we were going to be going to Japan on our way back to America. I wanted to do something new in Busan every single day until they arrived, but it was cold and I was tired. My body still hadn't really recovered from getting sick like that. On rainy days, I stayed in and played Persona 4 Golden. I beat the original on PS2 years ago, but now the whole moving to a farm town, spending a year at a new school, and exercising your personal demons thing felt a little more relevant. My friend Andrew came straight from school to come see me one last time. We went to one of those markets where you can pick something out and they'll take it to the back and cook it up for you on the spot. I don't know crab very well, but it was a big one, and they gave us so many banchan as well. The fact that it was only 1pm did not stop us from drinking soju either. He gave me one final side quest. This entire time, money was being deducted from my salary to contribute to the Korean pension system. Since I had no plans on retiring in this country, I could get that money back. I figured, how much could that be? 50 bucks? He said no. You're really gonna wanna do this. After gorging ourselves until we became crab meat stuffed human mandu, Andrew and I parted ways, but we still talk to each other every week when a new One Piece chapter drops. I wanted to walk off the food and alcohol down by Taejong Day Resort Park. I went here on a date once, but we got there too late and the sun would have set before we got the chance to explore it completely. When I descended to the rocky coast, there was a group of Chinese students hanging out taking photos by the waves. They all looked really cool standing against the ocean like that. I spoke to them in English and asked if they could take my picture too. And here I am, smiling beside a foreign sea. When I look at it, I think, there is so much more out there. Places I could never imagine. The next day, I looked into the paperwork required to getting that pension money. It all seemed straightforward enough, but I needed to find somewhere I could print the documents. I walked through Yunjae-gu looking for an office supply store that could help me out, but I couldn't find anywhere that offered it as a basic service. I typed printing into Kakao Maps and found a potential spot a few blocks away. When my phone told me I arrived, I didn't see it anywhere. There was a building there, but it was way too small to be an office. Just to be sure, I knocked. A grizzled and stout Korean ajushi, about my height, opened the door with a cigarette in his mouth. I could immediately tell from his face that this man had been working long hours his entire life. There were a few other guys in the office too, working on outdated computers. I asked in Korean, is this a printing company? I have something on this USB I need to print. He gave me a quick, gruff response in the Busan dialect. It ain't like that. I apologized for disturbing them, turned around and took my phone back out to look for the next place. A few moments later, the door opened back up and he invited me in to use their printer. This was some random company, but he could tell I was confused and needed help. They let me in and I finally obtained what I thought were the correct documents. While they were printing, they all asked the usual questions. Where are you from? Why did you come to our country? With step one to my pension retrieval side quest complete, all that was left was to go to the office and submit it. I took the elevator up to the pension office and asked the middle-aged woman at the front desk, She directed me to sit with the slim, well-dressed young man at the end of the row. He had flawless skin and eyebrows and assessed my documents with his large, nearly black eyes. First he asked, why did you come all the way from Changwon to do this here? You know there's an office much closer to you, right? I didn't have it in me to tell him that I didn't know this was a thing until one week before leaving the country. As he kept reading, the look on his face changed. Oh no, this is all wrong. I thought I was going to have to leave and start over, but before I could respond, he got up and went away for a few minutes. When he came back, he had the proper documents in his hand, and we did it together, line by line. South Korea is not a perfect place, but nearly every Korean I met was welcoming and friendly to this strange alien visiting their land. Over the past year, I came to really understand just how much pain this country was subjected to, and how much they've sacrificed to rebuild it. There are always new problems popping up, but I'm going to choose to have faith in the next generation. After all, I saw for myself just how many smart cookies were among them. I got back over $600 from that pension office. This wasn't money I was expecting to receive, so 
I could spend it guilt free. And do you know what a guy with chronic pain in his hand and wrist really needs? A PlayStation 5. I thought it would give me something to do when I got home to America. I started applying to jobs in New York, but I wasn't even getting any interviews. It might be a while before I find my next thing. I didn't want to think about any of that because my last few days in Korea had arrived. I loaded my massive suitcase on the KTX from Busan to Seoul. I got to see the Korean Shigol one last time as the high-tech train stampeded through its vast open plains. I thought about how different it would all be by the next time I visited Korea. How many more little farming towns were going to pop up, and how many foreigners would be sent there to teach English. When I got there, I ate at an incredible yakisoba restaurant I saw Tsuyang go to on YouTube. Carrying all that stuff around really hurt my arms, so I went to the hotel early to wait for my family to arrive. When I saw their taxi pull up on the other side of the hotel's glass doors, I didn't sprint out to meet them, and I didn't start to cry. All I felt was a comforting sense of normalcy that had been absent from my life for the past year. My last week in Korea didn't have to be about my grand journey and its tragic ending. It could just be a vacation with my family. We went out for barbecue their first night to celebrate our reunion. Sometimes they would pick some banchan off the table and say, What is this? I couldn't always tell them the English name, I only knew it in Korean. I'd just say, stop being American, it's good, just eat it. It was weird to see everyone a year older, to think that their lives went on without me. Time is everything, and I spent so long on this dream. It filled me with dread to think that I'd be coming home empty-handed, restarting my life to back where I was before. March 9th, 2023. There was no sunshine on my final day in Korea. The lingering chill of winter had frozen the clouds above. We didn't have anything planned except for the flight, and I ate my final meal in this country, a Krispy Kreme donut. I wished it was Dweji Gukbap instead, but my manager always told me it's only good down south. When I first arrived, I thought I'd blink and this year would be over in an instant, but I did so much, it feels like I've been living here my entire life. And now, I'm back at this airport, crawling across the finish line. The plane took off, and the Rabbit House Korea adventure drew to an unceremonious close. I really wanted to be excited about coming to Japan. We landed at the Kansai International Airport and were greeted by a big Mario-themed sign. I have always wanted to come to this country, and I was finally here, but it just didn't feel right. It's like 8pm on a Sunday night when you know you've got work bright and early the next day. I was gonna have to go home soon, and I didn't know who I was gonna be when I got back. After dropping our things off at the hotel, we walked through Osaka Castle Park. We got there too late in the day to actually go inside, and I was so angry I wanted to cry. There was so much I wanted to do in this country, but all I could think about was how long it would be before I could come back. Korea completely cleaned out my savings account, and I was not optimistic about my job prospects back home. It'll be years before I'm able to come back again. I could tell that my family knew I was upset, and because of that, they couldn't relax either. I just wanted to go off on my own and do everything I could at the impossible speed I tried to live my life at. When I got back to the hotel that night, I couldn't hold it in anymore. I went to my parents' room like some kind of scared child that just had a bad dream. I explained to them that yes, something's bothering me, and it's not you, and it's not this trip. It's me. They tried to plead with me and show me all the good in what I'd accomplished, but I didn't want to hear it. I had a goal, and I did not achieve it. I choked. I slept in the next morning and met up with my family later in the afternoon. My perspective didn't immediately change, but just getting that off my chest put me in the right mind to enjoy the rest of the trip. We took the bullet train from Osaka to Tokyo. While eating my ekiben, I pulled out my phone to check how close we were to Mount Fuji. This would be my only chance to see it on this trip, so I changed which side of the train I was sitting on and looked out the window. I'm looking, I'm looking, and nothing. Maybe I just didn't understand the map correctly. It's just one more thing that would have to wait until the next time I'm in Japan. I'm still really grateful that I was able to come here, and the rest of the trip was incredible. I ate so much good food, scouted for rare Pokemon cards, and walked Shibuya Crossing. During our flight back to the United States, nobody was really wearing masks on the plane, 
We're not really gonna get into that, but they never went away when I was in Korea. I'd be coming home to a new, different America, and I didn't really know what the vibe would be like. I thought I'd be overwhelmed with emotion upon coming home for the first time, but more than anything else, I was tired. My back and arm hurt from the plane ride. All I wanted to do was rest. But after those first few days of eating New York bagels and watching the Mets, I knew there was no way I could go back to the person I was before. Even little things like seeing my family wear shoes inside the house just doesn't sit right with me anymore. The weekend of March 24th, I went to PAX East. I knew a couple people from Eternal Return that would be going, and I wanted to get back to exploring new places and meeting with friends. I took my sister's car onto a ferry going to Connecticut, then drove to Boston. After learning to get around in both Korea and Japan, I feel like I've truly mastered navigation. At the con, I went to the Final Fantasy XVI presentation and stood in line to play Animal Well and get a picture with Donkey. Afterwards, I went out for Hot Pot with the Eternal Return crowd and hung out with everybody back at the hotel. When they'd talk about the game, I just sat there, smiling politely. At this point, it had been over six months since I last played, and I definitely wasn't keeping up with it. Our friendships are separate from the game, but I had to accept that the foundation they were built upon no longer existed. Eternal Return just isn't me anymore. During April of 2023, I realized that this process of reconstructing my life needed to happen fast. I have no money and no health insurance. I'm applying to jobs all over, not just gaming positions, but marketing work like I was doing before. Out of the hundreds of applications I sent, I only got one single interview. Maybe that big chunk of time on my resume dedicated to Korea was just off-putting to potential hiring managers. More realistically, most of these jobs probably never even existed in the first place. And even if I do go back to an advertising agency, is that really what I want to do? Living my life embedded into this 24-hour social media cycle? Isn't that what I'm trying to get away from? I definitely had no desire to get back into streaming. Now that my time as Rabbit House Games is over, I could start unpacking everything I've built up for the past two years. How much of my love of this game was real, and how much was decided by the metrics? How much did I like the community, and how much was it me liking them liking me? The answer I found was that I can't separate my feelings into what's clean and what's not. Scientifically speaking, it's just a bunch of stuff I did. Like the test subjects of Lumia Island, I experimented and failed, over and over, until something new was born. It wasn't all for nothing. We raised $10,000 for charity. I put people on to new opportunities, and the official casters get paid now. That's not my decision, but I took the initiative to make my part of this story happen. Even though this wound was starting to heal, I couldn't move forward until I moved on and I knew that was going to take some time. Being yourself is understanding yourself. I've spent so much of my life studying other things and running from the reality of who I am. Meeting people, going places, doing things, trying and failing. That's how you find your own voice. I knew that no matter what happened next, getting my body right had to be my first priority. Since I didn't have a job, public health insurance was my best option. And by best, I mean only. It sure would be nice if I lived in a country that didn't make healthcare a miserable experience. I've been told nice things like that are impossible, though. After I got approved, it took one month for my plan to start. During that time, I got into a car accident. I was sitting at a red light in the rain and was rear-ended by a truck. There was nothing I could have done. All I remember thinking was, thank goodness I don't have to go to the hospital right now. Eventually, my state-provided doctor wrote me a prescription for physical therapy three times a week at a local clinic. I wanted to go for my annual heart checkup as well now that I was back home, but my cardiologist died of a heart attack. When I first met the PT staff, I was embarrassed to tell them how this injury came about. They said the pain in my arm was coming from muscle irritation caused by overuse and excessive nerve tension. Those last three words stuck in my mind long after that meeting ended. I shouldered all that weight for so long because I thought, on some level, it would absolve me of being an imperfect, insignificant little human. Does that sound like a guy with excessive nerve tension to you? I'm young and healthy, I thought this would just go away. I refused to give this pain a name because I didn't want to accept it as reality. 
Physical therapy literally gave me the strength to start building my future. I could even start playing my PS5 as long as I took frequent breaks to rest and stretch my arm. But honestly, there's like no games for that thing, and I could definitely be using this time more productively. When people ask me, oh, you were in Korea? What was that like? I always have the same answer. The food is great, the country is beautiful, and I had an incredible time. This is true, but as you can tell by this massive video, I obviously have a lot more to say. But how could I? Who the hell wants to listen to me ramble about my life for over an hour? Writing is turning overthinking into art. Rabbit House Games was a massive project like nothing I've ever done before. I want to understand it and I want people to know my story. Not because I need their likes or attention, but because maybe I could cut through the noise and help them find peace in their own lives. The name Rabbit House was a story I told myself. Not quite a mask, but an engine of present continuous self-mythology. If this is who I say I am, it's who I will be. What a coincidence that I just happened to conclude that I was the guy. If you're going to achieve anything, optimism is mandatory. If you didn't think it would work, why would you even start in the first place? Self-mythology is built into the content creation process. There are millions of creators fighting for your screen time right now. Of course, I had to pretend like I was the most important one. I'm American. Worship of the individual self is what this country was founded on. Writing this was challenging but fun, and understanding my story helped me forgive myself for trying and failing. And for Eternal Return, maybe I was just a few years too early. I proved something like me was possible. Just because I didn't succeed the way I dreamed of doesn't mean someone else can't do it. They may even be watching this video right now. The further I got into this memoir, the more I realized it was missing an ending. Something I would have to write myself. On July 20th, 2023, Eternal Return finally left Early Access and went 1.0. The player count skyrocketed at first, but as always, it's slowly fizzling away as the hype dies down. The launch update removed solos and duos, making squads the only available game mode. This move was to condense the workload of balancing the game, as well as put a band-aid over the low player numbers. You find lobbies a lot faster when everyone is playing the same format. Without solos, the game I once loved is gone, and I don't plan on ever coming back. Maybe having two teammates with you can help a beginner understand what's going on, but a game that was once difficult for new players is now almost completely impenetrable. Since the day Michael Reeves coined the term Herbs Playing Family, They've added augments, credits, escape, battle zones, whatever summoner spells are called, and tons of new characters. I don't think they should make it easier for the sole purpose of mass appeal, but for a game that has some pretty obvious player churn problems, they could benefit from pumping the brakes just a little bit. Maybe they wouldn't need to embrace such a maximalist design philosophy in the gameplay if the fans were more engaged with the broader world and characters. Like, people really love their mains, why are you not leaning more into this? Think about how crazy people would go if they dropped a story-driven co-op game mode with a specific cast of characters fully voice acted. I know it's a lot of work, but that's game development. Nimble Neuron did actually try to show us what was happening with this world, but it's only in that original game, Immortal Soul. It seemed like they were layering all sorts of secrets and exposition behind the scenes, just as a little treat for the fans that put the clues together. Wait, what? Immortal Soul was shut down so that Nimble Neuron could focus entirely on Eternal Return. Instead of pursuing that original vision, they've put all their chips on making something that's sort of like Fortnite meets League of Legends. In its current state, the game is bloated and directionless. From my perspective, it doesn't have the confidence to maintain a singular vision and let the game just be itself. I know what it's like to lose track of what makes you special when you're just focused on making numbers go up on a screen. I've also heard from former employees that a lot of unfavorable decisions come directly from upper management at Kakao. Making good video games is really, really hard. After everything, I still have a lot of respect for the dev team, and I know there are people at Nimble Neuron that genuinely want to make this game better. I once heard a story that a player in Korea who was mad about character balance literally went to Nimble Neuron's office, got past the security guard, and started yelling at the employees there. 
From their perspective, I'm kind of like that crazy guy. Except when I went to their office, I did it with fantastic dreams in my heart and stars in my eyes. I don't want to see Eternal Return fail. This video was made in good faith and I definitely don't want people to feel sorry for me about how things went down. Maybe all these changes will pay off someday. I will always want to see my friends succeed. I'm just not going to sit around waiting for the rocket to take off. The weekend of the game's launch, I traveled to Denver for my friend's bachelor party. Instead of streaming and running routes through the redesigned Lumia Island, we were drinking, hiking, and ziplining. I knew I was in the right place. If I got that job, I wouldn't be here right now. There's freedom in failure. Getting hired and saving this game felt like the perfect ending when this story started, but the only way I could have thought that was because there were so many things I didn't know. People tried to warn me, but I didn't know where these walls would be until I hit them myself. On top of Lookout Mountain in Golden, Colorado, it all clicked that these challenges are how we define ourselves. Sometimes we break through them, sometimes we just don't have it in us. That's life. You never know until you try. So, what now? What is my next challenge? I want to climb Mount Fuji. Soko ni yama ga aru kara. I didn't even get to see it when I was in Japan. No mental gymnastics, no savior complex. Just a small rabbit versus a big mountain. Nothing for me to prove to anyone but myself. Hey! There are no rules. Step one is going back to Japan so I can do this right. But I really can't afford to do that right now. There's a way I can solve both of those problems at once. I have some teaching experience now, and I know working with kids makes me happy. The path forward has never been more obvious. My students in Korea saved me from a version of myself that never should have existed. Their innocent love for life kept me grounded, even when everything around me was falling apart. Now I get to keep being a teacher. I took four different trains to go from New York to DC. The interview for the school I wanted was over six hours long and had to be in person because we sat for a grammar exam and performed a mock lesson. Right before the interview, I tweeted a selfie and called my shot. I didn't do it to boost my confidence. I know I win these. My reasoning was practical, not personal. This would be the last thing I need to finish writing the memoir. No better time to start building up my comeback story. During the lunch break, I met with my competition, most of whom had never taught before. One guy asked me why I went to Korea. I gave him the two-sentence version of this story, and he said, Oh yeah, Eternal Return! I know that! I just started playing it in the summer! I was stunned. That has never happened before. I really found one of you out in the wild. And if you're watching this video, Hi, Matt. Similar to Korea, the job application asked if I had any tattoos. I've always wanted one, but it's just more convenient for me not to have them right now. In the beginning of this video, I called my scars a tattoo meaning memento mori. But the more I think about it, the more I realize it doesn't have to be a negative reminder of death. Instead, I can laugh at it the way one might after a bullet grazes their head. Everything I am could have never existed. Since the day I came out of that operating room and was handed back to my parents, I've just been one lucky rabbit. It wasn't a guarantee that I'd be able to leave the hospital and go back to our house. 27 years later, I am alive, and I can live around the world. On October 4th, that bittersweet employment offer finally hit my inbox. I cried for more than 5, but less than 10 minutes. Before Korea, I had no understanding of what life abroad was like. Now, I know the weight of leaving your loved ones behind so you can try something new. It's happening all over again, but I'm ready this time, and I know that leaving home doesn't mean it's forever. I start my new job on February 6th, 2024. If anybody wants to buy a lightly used PS5 before then, please let me know. I don't know if airplanes can take off with something that big on board. A few weeks later, while preparing my visa documents, I reached out to a certain friendly dolphin since it had been a while since I heard from him. He said he was coming to New York soon and was down to get dinner with some old friends. 
I recommended a Turkish restaurant down the street from the old apartment where this all started. When I sat down to eat with Flipper, Taco, and Bran, I told them all about the things I saw, did, and ate in Korea. And when the conversation shifted to eternal return, I could talk about it with eyes unclouded. It was the first time I told anybody I was writing this memoir. They were not surprised to hear I had one more rabbit to pull out of my hat. Even while recording this video, my arm still isn't fully healed. I'm gonna keep getting older and my body will continue to break down. But right now, I'm mostly healthy and I shouldn't take that for granted. Every morning, I wake up and do my stretches of gratitude. It hurts, but in a good way. Feelings like that are how you know you're human and alive. When I finally return to that eternal light, I know I'll go out with a smile on my face. Until that day comes, this is a story about freedom. Thank you for watching and welcome to Rabbit House World. Love and peace. I feel so much better now.